Now that we have discussed the kind of information that is needed for prognostic research and the ways in which we can collect that data, it is time to consider how we can use that information to provide evidence for use in clinical practice. Imagine that the longitudinal study we designed previously for our lymphoma research question has already been conducted. We enrolled patients over a period of time and measured a range of patient characteristics at baseline, including general information, medical conditions, disease-specific information, biochemistry and treatment information. We followed that group of patients for five years and recorded their follow-up time up until one of three situations. The patient died, the patient left the study for another reason, or up until the end of the five-year follow-up period, indicating that they survived for five years after baseline. We have a wealth of information available, but before we discuss how to analyze this information, we should remind ourselves of the aim of our study. Remember, in prognostic research, the goal is to provide clinicians and patients with accurate, patient-specific prognostic predictions. And the end result should be an absolute value that clinicians give to their patients and use to make decisions. How can we provide clinicians with the means of reaching these predictions based on the information we have collected in our study? Commonly, the information collected in prognostic studies is used to develop a clinical prediction rule, usually based on some kind of multivariable regression model. These models can be as simplistic or complex as needed and often must strike a balance between prediction accuracy and practicality. So what exactly is a prediction rule? It generally consists of a scoring system where different patient characteristics receive a score. And the sum of each of these score values then corresponds to a predicted risk of a certain outcome over time. Perhaps the most famous example of such a score is the APGAR score. Developed by Virginia APGAR in 1952, the APGAR score is used to decide the health status of newborn babies and in turn make implicit prognostic predictions. The score consists of five components, each relating to a characteristic of the newborn child. For each characteristic, a newborn child can score zero, one or two points, depending on the strengths of the observed characteristic. The scores over the five categories can then be combined as a total score, which can be used to classify newborn children into low to high risk categories, which can help then to be used to decide whether a child needs immediate medical attention. More complex prognostic models are generally developed by fitting some kind of multivariable regression model to a set of empirical data. There are various ways to do this, but the most essential points to remember are that the method you choose should utilize your data fully, and the end result should be something that can be used in practice. So for example, if follow-up time was collected, you may want to consider approaches that can use that properties, such as a Cox proportional, proportional hazard model. A frequent problem that researchers come across while developing a prognostic model is the issue of which predictors they should include in their model. As mentioned in a previous lecture, it is essential that you make some kind of choice during the design phase of your study so that you only collect relevant information. You might not, however, wish to include all of that information in your prediction rule, as some of the information may still not be relevant and there may be practical reasons for ex excluding some predictors. The ideal way to do this is by making a pre-selection of predictors based on evidence from the literature or experts in the subject. The next approach is to use selection techniques based on statistical criteria. Another important issue to consider is missing data. When viewing your data, you may find some information was not recorded for some patients during the follow-up period. When information is missing, it is vitally important to consider why the data is missing and what the most appropriate course of action is. Because prognostic research is longitudinal by nature and can sometimes span very long periods of time, missing information can be a big problem and should never be overlooked. Now let us assume that we have decided on the appropriate analytical approach. 
we have appropriately handled missing data, and we have fitted a regression model to our data. What next? In general, you will end up with a set of regression coefficients, and these will act as the basis of our prediction rule. You could choose to simplify the model, rounding the coefficients to whole numbers to create a ready-to-use rule, or create tools such as nomograms, web calculator, or even apps. It is ultimately up to you how you want to present your prediction model as long as it can be used readily in practice. As mentioned before, prognostic research is never simple. And there is one complication that we should always address. And that is, most of the time when a new prediction model is applied in practice, it performs more poorly than it did in the original study. And why is this? Well, even the best prognostic studies are limited in that they cannot include everyone. The data that you use to develop your prediction rule is only based on a small representation of the whole clinical domain. So the chances are, if you have built your model correctly, it will be very well tuned to the group of people in your study, but that may not be the case for new people from slightly different populations. If you want your fellow clinicians to trust in your research and apply it in new patients, you need to convince them that your prediction rule can be accurate in new populations. The recommended way of doing this is to perform what is called a validation study. This generally involves collecting data in the same way as you did for your first study, but from a different group of people, different in time or geographical location. You can then test your prediction rule in new patients to see how well it performs and whether it still seems good enough for use in clinical practice. This is all well and good, but the collection of prognostic information is expensive and can take years. Imagine having to wait another five years to collect information for a validation study of our lymphoma model. And to make things worse, your validation study might seem less convincing to clinicians if you yourself perform it. You have already invested a lot into developing your prediction rule, so it could be hard to objectively assess its performance. One way to get around this is through collaboration. It is becoming increasingly common for development and validation studies to be conducted simultaneously at different centers by different research groups. Therefore, validation should really be considered at the first stages of designing your study. The final question that needs to be asked is whether the new model will actually improve patient outcomes in practice and whether its use is actually cost effective. This is an altogether new research question, one that lies within a different part of the DAP model in therapeutic or intervention research. We will look into this more in detail during next week's lectures, but it is important to understand at this stage that the validated prognostic model is not the end of the story.